Dave White and Bonnie Stewart. Um, everybody is a presenter because it's going to be a very interactive session. So we're giving all participants who are joining presenter rights. We'll be recording the session. And I'd just like to ask you, please, to put your hands together or give us a smiley face to give both Bonnie and David a very warm welcome at OER20. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good um, morning. For me, it's super morning, uh, so I actually feel like I'm up in the middle of the night with uh, with all of you. It feels strangely intimate, um, although not um, in a fun way. Not the most kind of caring way to be up, but <laughs> that, that's all right. Um, I'm Bonnie Stewart. I'm in Windsor, Ontario, in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I'm Dave White, and I am in Oxfordshire, the Shires in uh, the UK. And so, we want to open by trying something, um, just sort of to, to get a sense of everyone who's with us. If you are able, I'd love to see if you're able to go uh, to the top of your screen right now and find either a pencil icon or the large T. And if you're able to type in or scroll in or draw in or throw in a picture, um, of where you are based this morning. Now, Marin has agreed to give everyone presenter access so that you're able to use this feature of Collaborate. If everyone doesn't mind not moving the slide forward, but just writing on it, that's much appreciated. Thank you. We have Cardiff, we have Valencia, we have Glasgow, we have Isle of Wight and Enfield, all kinds of places, South Africa. Isle of Wight. I grew up on the Isle of Wight. Did you? Yeah. Uh, that's a long story, but I mean, whoever's been. on the Isle of Wight knows how specific the Isle of Wight is culturally. I'll leave it there. Wow, there's a good, there's a good well, yeah. um, range of people. And um, you know I, what I like about this is, and is that I, occasionally I forget that we're in geographically different places because the web has just become the one place to rule them all in the last few weeks. And doing this is a, just a really amazing reminder of the, the, what the technology is doing for us in some ways. Yeah, it's a totally different time of day for many people. Someone's in New York, um, Leamington Spa. Okay, thank you so much for being here. And the other question that we wanted to kind of open with, because it's strange times, um, Jim Luke, Detroit Strong. Good morning, Jim. Um, how are you doing? This is an odd, frightening experience for many of us, not so much hopefully being here and collaborate, but I would love um, to just kind of give everyone a chance to to let us know what kind of space you're in. Um, I myself found that knowing that I had to get up this morning was um, something that made it very, very difficult for me to go to sleep. Um, oh, God. That's and hard. that isn't totally a uh, natural for me, but what I've been realizing that one of the ways that I've been managing my 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 own anxiety, I guess, in in this time is just being like, oh well, I don't have to get up. I'll sleep when I sleep. It's fine. But the minute that I told myself, oh, you need to get some sleep, um, suddenly that. Uh, I managed to think about a lot of things that probably aren't conducive to to going to sleep. I'm glad to hear some some folks are doing really well and really happy, and other folks are <laughs> feeling a bit trapped, a um, little anxious, a little confused. Um, some others are struggling with proper sleep. The juggling work with kids' home is something. Uh, someone has a partner who's a frontline health worker and was at the hospital all night. Um, that's a whole family experience that um, has to be really hard on lots of fronts. And I have huge thanks um, for all the families that are that are navigating that. So varied is the answer. Yeah. Which is fair enough. And I think, you know, we want to run the session taking into account the uh, the, uh, the, the the larger, you know, the fact that we're all in various different states and and what have you, it, uh, we want to try and be caring in the session itself. So we're going to try and go at a pace that's perhaps slightly slower than we normally would, and we'll see where we get to. But it's really good to get the feel of the room and 
as with any sessions like this, it's nice to, I mean, even now I feel like I kind of know people just a little bit, whereas at the start of the session, people were just a list of names. So, I mean, I do know some of you as well, but you know, the, these kind of little moments are really important to me right now. All right, shall we move the slide ahead? Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for engaging in that. So our goal today was to open a conversation around open pedagogy and the idea of how does it impact system care? How does it scale to care? Um, spoiler alert. We have never been sure from the time that we proposed this session that it does. And at the same time, so much ground is shifting under our feet right now that we wanted to make sure that we kind of acknowledged the current moment, this uh, here is getting called the pivot to online. I'm not sure what it's being called where everyone is, um, but this kind of mass onlineness that is really new and a little bizarre for many of us who've been working in this space for a decade or more, um, suddenly everyone is here, at least in some sense, but we're also seeing new concerns rise. Um, to me, it's a really, really important moment to talk about open pedagogy, to talk about the values of open pedagogy, um, and to talk about perhaps what we do lose or what comes into further tension when we have mass numbers of people online. So did, Dave, do you want to talk about the, the Paquette idea particularly? It comes out of Christina Hendricks. Thank you so much, Christina, for this. She went back to 1979 and found a Canadian um, original uh, definition of foundational values of open pedagogy. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll move on to the next uh, slide, actually, to talk about scale, uh, because uh, what, one of the things that's in, in, so I'm head of digital learning at the University of the Arts London, which is Europe's slash maybe the world's largest art and design focused higher education uh, institution. And so I think one of the things that was really important to me when we were, well, to both of us when we were developing this, this session is to acknowledge scale. I think a lot of the the discourse around the idea of care, open pedagogy and digital sort of works quite well if you've got a small amount of students. But my certainly my personal concern is that um, as the as the cohort size gets bigger, the pressure on the teaching staff to provide scale becomes more and more. And so a lot of the discussion around care is about treating students as individuals, um, building relationships and those kind of methods. But ha can you can you do that with 500 students or you or do you just become exhausted? So putting my institutional hat on, I was concerned that, um, call, you know, this this focus on kindness and care, the net result might be to just simply uh, have the people that were most sincere in terms of staff burning out. And so it's, I think we need to, it's important to acknowledge that. And that's why we put the session together in the way that we did. Just coming back on what Bond said about us being suspicious that actually it's not scalable with open pedagogy. We, it, it's been, yeah, I'm currently teaching 2,400 students. Okay. So in essence, you can't, you're not going to be having a nice chat with each of them. Okay. So I, I'd love to hear how you are. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I, I think, you know, we've actually, it's been a difficult session to design because actually so much of this is in tension with each other and at, at, so, so much of these themes are in tension with each other and that's what we want to explore. Um, just sort of setting that up there. Should we move to the next question, Bon? Because that's sure. kind of coming what up. Sure, what we to do? So I have taught for about 20 years, but mostly in with the privilege of teaching relatively small classes. Um, I've also worked as, um, as staff and had to do some work that was more institutionally focused in terms of PD or faculty development with much larger numbers. And I find that the capacity to do that kind of 
individual connection that I think of the work of open pedagogy as based in because that kind of um, the Paquette definition that Christina Hendricks had had drawn out and put forward identifies three sets of tensions that are foundational values. One is autonomy and, inter and interdependence. One is freedom and responsibility. And one is democracy and participation. I'm always working to encourage participation in um, my any kind of class setting or any kind of facilitated setting that I that I work with. But it is generally easier for me, at least in terms of the open pedagogy practices that I have, um, showing folks how to engage with networks, et cetera, when there is a small enough group that I can see how people are doing. Not all of you may be teachers, and I recognize that. So we kind of put teaching and learning here. But I'd, I'd love to see and hear what kind of contexts are, are familiar for you. Um, thanks for moving that, whoever moved the, the full sentence down, just so we can see everybody's. So we've got 5 to 500, 140, 50 to 200, 25 to 500, um, up to 300, 15 to 50. You know, so yeah, and I think there's a, I think there's a, sorry, Bob, I think there's a Go question. Ahead. There's a question here as to how, what's, a re, what's a reasonable group size before these kind of very human, very connected way, modes of care start to break down or start to become very difficult to support? And, that, and then what techniques can we use to ensure that care is part of what we're doing, but isn't, isn't as I say, running around having a, a, a chat with everybody? And is that even possible? I mean, we're looking at quite, there's, there's some pretty big ranges in here. And one of the things about the internet, um, for me, when I first began teaching online, that I had to adapt for, I think I recall Stephen Downs writing a post about this, I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago. Um, but the distinction between a, a group and a network, and when you are in a face-to-face -face class, you can see everyone who is there, and even the person who doesn't engage, I can see them sitting at the back of the class, potentially kind of with that, um, having a smoke at the back of the class look on their face, and recognize that that in itself is a form of communication. But in an online class, I can see names in a chat room, I can see names on a syllabus potentially, but once you get over you know, 20 or 30 people, I'm not able in any moment to be to draw someone out or to recognize um, silence as communication from a specific individual you can't see the room right in the same way and so it's figuring out how to engage with care while engaging in open pedagogy is is one of those challenges when you have a network rather than a group that's totally visible to you um, if we all do have presenter access, super, thanks. <laughs> um, so if you don't mind not playing with the arrows, um, that would be great because you can move the slides as, as we've just figured out and that's totally okay. Um, thank you everyone for contributing to those numbers. Once you've moved the slide back and forth, you do lose the, the interactions, but I think we got a great sense of what kind of spaces people are accustomed to. Um, Su Ming is saying their largest class is actually about 660 but our largest room only seats about 400. So you have to break that group up. Um, and just moving forward, um, I noticed that Aras Bozkurt is here from Turkey. And Aras, I don't know if you're actually, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Are you willing to take the mic? If, if you want just to tell people about the, the size and scale of students that you work with. No pressure, maybe a little pressure. Oh, thank you, Aras. Uh, go ahead, just, just hit. Are you able to speak? I don't think your mic is on, Aris. No, can't hear you, sorry. Um, I had actually asked Aris last, um, no, you go ahead. I, I'm, if, if you want to keep trying, that's cool, or jump in. But I can also try to articulate this, and you can correct me in the chat. I'm good with that. Can you okay. hear now? I can hear you now. Wonderful, welcome. Sorry, no, uh, it was by default muted, my microphone, and 
I, I couldn't uh, consider to unmute it anyway. Um, I want to tell you about some uh, another university. You know, we had a conversation earlier. It is one of the largest university by student number. We have three million students, and around one million of uh, these students are taking their courses in each term. Our classes change, you know, from one thousand to three hundred thousand. I mean, it's really, really large. <laughs> so last. Um... December, Aros and I ended up in Barcelona at the same time and got to meet up for the first time and after having been online colleagues for quite a few years and he was talking about his classes and my jaw was, there was a scale there that I just hadn't even considered, right? I have heard of classes of 600, but the up to 300,000 was, um, and, and 3 million was just kind of beyond my realization. And so there are spaces and scales, particularly as we move online and higher ed shifts to that, that go past the capacity to make individual connections with other people, where you are dealing with broadcast communication by default and a huge scale by default that impacts the types of practices that I know how to use. And so this was part of the conversation that Dave and I were having was around how, how do we facilitate a conversation that brings some of these huge scale questions to the table. And then, of course, the, the current situation, um, what is it, this unprecedented time, I think is the, the quote that I keep reading in just about every communication from my own institution and every other institution. Um, and I have to say, I, I give my own institution reasonable props for dealing with this thus far in as humane a manner as, as they've been able to. Um, but there is um, a real challenge as we try to move whole institutions online rather than just oh, that's Bonnie, that's what she does. Sure, her classes are going to be there and some other faculty's classes are going to be there, but we have never done a, a whole kind of scale move online as an institution like we are doing now. And everything at my institution will be fully online till at least September and we'll see afterwards. How many of you is that the case for? Is it just in the chat, if, if people don't mind sharing, have your institutions almost all said that they would go fully online or? Yours is, Dave? Yeah, I, I mean, I think at this point, most spaces have um, confirmed that. <laughs> Kate Murphy pivoted uh, to teaching sculpture online in the last two weeks. Yeah, and I mean, for, for some of us, particularly when we do hands-on kind of work, um, there are real challenges with this, right? I, in the summertime, I'm working with some faculty who teach in our University of Windsor. It's called the Tech Ed Program, and it's a program, um, it's essentially an adult ed style program for folks who want to teach automotive, welding, um, any of the sort of technical education classes in our Ontario high schools. And a lot of those classes, I, I think uh, culinary, uh, hairstyling, those are not things that, that normally are not taught with some kind of very, very hands-on component. So these are folks who are going to be teaching. They're experts in their field, but those fields are very hands-on. And the people who are teaching them are um, accustomed to, to working with them face to face and so make adaptation is is a real change i'm just noticing what gabby is saying there's a real fear of talking about student engagement online really weird yeah they just want to focus on the tech one of the things that that i'm seeing um is a, a shift to the content pushing out and sometimes when people are anxious particularly people and i i don't mean uh, diagnosably anxious, but rather just 
put into a new situation that that creates that oh my goodness i don't know what i'm doing the, the default is to fall back on the things that you already know how to do which may be to consider how many hours you're spending as you're teaching or what you're pushing out to students as you're teaching and um so we're seeing that response from faculty and and then yes as gabby points out on the other side and i'll talk about this a little bit in the debate that Dave and I are setting up, um, content, right? The the commercial um, big names and corporate names in our field just who've been waiting in the wings for a moment to push forward shifts that that may be very concerning to us all. Um, I'm just reading the the chat here, Dave. Is there anything else that you want to? Um, you mean I, I'm I mean uh, I'm current with. I, I drafted a first version of uh, a, an online engagement uh, student, an online student engagement policy for UAL for my institution yesterday, and I think it's I think it's a really really tricky area. Um, uh, there's there's um, in my institution we're actually actually the 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 tricky area is going the other way, not content, but making everything a Blackboard Collaborate session and having nothing else around it. Because obviously, and I think that's reasonable, but I think in terms of care, that's that that can be that is troublesome because of you know this is a very particular mode. Only certain people can engage with it technologically. Only certain people can engage with it in terms of literacies and all of the rest of it. And so, for you know, in terms of um, trying to create a fair and relatively equitable environment, the advice that we're giving is that you're, you, know, you need a balance of content and contact. That's the simplest way we could put it. So that's been our response. But we'll get to that later. I feel like I'm, I'm undercutting my our own uh, workshop. So should we move <laughs> on to the next? There's some great chat in there, and um, it's it is really interesting times. And just to, just the last thing on this, I think. Sometimes I'm seeing people who don't operate online uh, as a matter of a course are imagining that they just need to find like a silver bullet platform. And it's always the platform that the university doesn't own, whichever one it is. So we're trying to put, a, we, again, there's a, for me, it, as ever, the, the, there's this real need to have an emphasis on what teaching is and teaching practices in and through the technology. So for me, in simple terms, it's all the same as it ever has been, but we need to emphasize it even more right now. Do you know what I mean? Everything we're saying is just good practice that's been good practice for 20 years. But it's finding a way of suddenly doing that in two weeks. So to focus that down a little bit, the initial thing that Dave and I had planned was a debate. Um, I drew the short straw. Uh, we wanted to talk about the idea of care in open pedagogy and at the same time, the surveillance that often gets opened up when people engage in what works as open pedagogy for us. Um, and so I am about to make a case that online, uh, open pedagogy online promotes a culture of care. And to some extent, um, so I'm going to leap in, Dave, I have never done a parliamentary debate before. I do not know the proper terms to use. Um, can you just give me a time frame so that yeah, I, I mean, just will to, you be, to be re to be reasonable? I think you should have like five minutes max and I'll let you know. We're okay. not we're not going to do like a full on debate, really. Bond's going to present one side of the argument. I'm going to present the other side of the argument just so that we can just to kind of frame up a discussion that we can all have. Uh, in a moment. Um, so debate, you know, debate's probably a strong word. It's probably like one side and then the other side. So okay. would you, because we just thought it'd be a fun way of getting through some a lot of material. Um, I will hand over to you, Bon, and I will raise my hand when you get to five minutes. How's that? Uh, I'd rather like a nice loud gong, actually, but if you want to well, play, I, raise your hand, that would be very caring. I'll Dave. make Thank a you gong so noise at you then. <laughs> All right. Okay. And I will, I will actually try to be concise because I just I want I'm I'm if I am missing points that are relevant for you, please do feel free to continue to share them in the chat. Um, I want to talk about open pedagogy as for me founded in those 
three sets of tensions and values that Paquette brings out, autonomy and interdependence, freedom and responsibility, and democracy and participation. Um, for me, open pedagogy is always student-centered. It puts learners at the center because it's focused on networked engagement. That I recognize that when I'm teaching from an open pedagogy perspective, I'm teaching from a place or I'm engaging as, um, as a facilitator from a place where I recognize that everybody's already in their own space. Everybody's already in their own life. They may not be familiar with the things that I'm trying to teach, but they do know things. And I'm looking at them as an autonomous person, but also us as an interdependent we, whatever that we or community is for that moment, um, and that my, the learners have the opportunity and the freedom to take what they're going to take out of that um, experience that I'm sort of setting up for them, um, and that to some extent I'm not fully in control of it, um, that there is a democratic element where if enough of them have a particular perspective, um, we're going to shift but through their participation to do different things. Um, a few years back, I actually, I did my PhD in Twitter, um, as one does, perhaps, and I, what I wanted to look at was how academics networked participation um, kind of lines up against their formal institutional academic engagement. And my thesis findings, I'm just going to throw a paper into the chat here. Um, but my thesis findings included a core realization that for many folks who engage in open online practices, pedagogical and also just scholarly more broadly, care is central. Um, networks both visibly amplify vulnerability and they also amplify care. And so there's a, there's a really important for me in if we can just stay on this slide. There we go. For me, there's a really important thing where um, engaging online in a network makes you more visible than you would other be and therefore more vulnerable to certain kinds of, for instance, scholars of color, um, students of color, women who have strong opinions may be dragged down um, or uh, piled onto more so than uh, they might be if they were less visible, but also there it opens up vectors for people to express care for them in many real ways. In terms of care right now, networks are the thing and my open networks are the thing that are getting me beyond my house. Right. Um, at a personal level, uh, I've got a bunch of groups that I'm in, DM chats and Twitter humor. Um, my networks are giving me resources for homeschooling my kids. <laughs> homeschooling my kids. Um, I'm doing a lot of crowdsourcing of my networks. But open networks also open the world of participatory education to my kids, where they get the chance to, for instance, our music class yesterday was I needed them to leave me alone for a little while. So I sent them upstairs, uh, one with the guitar, and they ended up recording a version of Puff the Magic Dragon after much fighting, which they then put out onto the internet um, as their music class, uh, they're contributing to knowledge abundance, right? They're getting comments on that. They're, they're getting a sense of work that they're doing with real audiences. And I think that that can um, matter a great deal. And in terms of open pedagogy, I see that capacity to contribute to audiences and that validation um, hand in hand with some of the trusting of students, no matter the size of class, um, in terms of, for instance, the advocacy that we're seeing right now to trust students in the face of online proctoring services or the push, hey, don't be just giving exams right now, trust your students, different ways to engage, don't just surveil them. But there is a tension um, between trust and care that I can extend through networks um, in any kind of facilitation setting um, and that surveillance nature of most of the tools that I'm using. My kids put their video out on Facebook. I know that 
Facebook is a hugely flawed space and a hugely flawed system. And so, thank you. So the question of scale caring, I think network scale becomes overwhelming for people. Sometimes I have too many DM chats, but more importantly, we're often doing open pedagogy on non-open platforms, and the platforms are corporatized to extraction and surveillance. So Dave, take that in. Hey, you at the end there a little bit, I feel. <laughs> Just a little bit. Fair. Okay, so I'm gonna talk, if you can time me for five, um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about the surveillance side, and uh, I think, and I'm starting now, so I think this is, all the more important um, given uh, the uh, current situation where everybody's piling online. But what I want to do is to come back to open pedagogy, because the question is open pedagogy online promotes a culture of care. Does it, does it actually, the, the key word is promotes there, okay. And just uh, in the middle of the Hendricks quote earlier about open pedagogy, there were these things mentioned, individualized learning, learner choice, and self-direction. OK. And uh, what I want to argue is that these things in the digital are actually now fundamentally in kind of unrecognizable tension with each other. Um, so everything that Bond said, I agree with to a certain extent. I think that it is possible for open pedagogy to promote a culture of care. The point I'm making is not that that isn't effective in of itself. The point I'm making is that the digital environments that we're in are actually um, set up such that every moment of care becomes a moment, a potential moment of surveillance. So when we talk about care, it's a very interpersonal human thing. But all of those connections with each other, all of those conversations, all of those moments of, of helping each other, all of those moments of kindness, they're all tracked by the platforms. And so as we, as we go about our caring, we're expanding what Zuboff, so this is a book that I've been reading, which is um, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. We're expanding what Zuboff calls this, the shadow text, the data text that's underneath all of these platforms. And you guys know this probably because you've come to OER, so you're probably aware of this, but I wanna set it, I wanna give it an educational and a care kind of context. So for me, the language of care is the language of surveillance, okay? I'm not saying that care doesn't exist, but I'm saying they're, beco they're, they're becoming one and the same thing, because here's the proposition in the digital. We can care for you as long as you tell us everything about yourself. If you relinquish your rights to your own identity, to your own data, to your own uh, connections, if you relinquish your rights to privacy, to your own ability to have your own internal um, intellectual world, then we can care for you. So words like personalization are a catch-all for both what appears to be care, but definitely surveillance, okay? Because we will personalize your education. You just have to give up all of your data. So on the one hand, it appears to be caring because it appears to be focused on the individual. But on the other hand, actually, it's just growing that shadow text. And the shadow text is there so that good old fashioned capitalism can manipulate us uh, so that people who run the platforms can do what's called um, a kind of um, social physics and nudge us. And of course, everybody wants that, our students, because they are the graduate. They're going to graduate. They're going to be the people that are likely to be earning the most money in the future. And you might say, well, Dave, that's fine. That's what Google and Amazon and all those evil people are doing. But actually, I'd say that education is sleepwalking into exactly the same setup. So if we think about um, learner analytics, if we think about smart campus, if we think about the way that we use a lot of third party providers, everything we say when we when we talk about care is going into that data and is and is eventually controlling us and we're losing our self-determination. So I just want to finish by going back to that quote, individualized learning, learner choice and self-direction. What I'd say is in the current environment, the individualized learning and, and the, 
the apparent learner choice is actually reducing self-direction. And so often our attempts at care and certainly institutionalized versions of care are actually reducing our own self-determination because we're trying to provide students with funnels that they can go down and with answers to questions that they haven't even asked yet. So we're losing our agency. And for me, education is about facilitating agency. It's about encouraging students to have the confidence to find their own agency in the world. And this is my concern. I'm going to stop there. Dave, I agree with many of the things you said. <laughs> I suspect um, you might. Yeah, no, I mean, f fair enough. And one of the questions for me is how do we engage students in any kind of open and online spaces, particularly those that are not open source in their origins, but even open source spaces still have learning analytics and surveillance capacity built into them at increasingly institutional scales. Um, so the question there that Jim's bringing up, right, is nudging even compatible with true caring or is it fundamentally antithetical? If I'm pushing you towards um, and, and this is not limited to the digital. If I am nudging you in uh, t towards being a good student, whatever that means, am I truly expressing care for your agency? Mm. So these are, these are real questions for us. Um, Dave's going to talk yeah. a little bit about speculative design. So this is what we want to do. We, we, we just wanted to set that all up and we wanted to be completely honest about where we are with this. Um, uh, you know, I think just on a very personal note, sometimes the, the discourse around care and teaching and in the digital, it, it just makes me feel guilty uh, rather than supports me in knowing how to respond. So we wanted to open up that discussion. Um, so what we were going to do if we were face to face with this speculative design exercise, I think what we're going to simplify that. I just wanted to put this in front of you as a really interesting way of kind of imagining futures. Uh, I think what happens is things can become operational very quickly. So the the idea of speculative design is that it 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 doesn't try and extend the current position into a future and it doesn't necessarily operate within the restrictions of who and what our institutions are now, for example. Um, so it is a speculation on the future and what you might come up with might not be possible, but it might be probable or it might be something that's worth thinking about. So it's like a blank canvas starting point. But in, in truth, I think what we wanted to do, because then the whole world changed, uh, in about, for uh, for me, about four days, I'd say, in reality, what we wanted to do was just ask you this question. Uh, should we do this as a live slide, Bon, or? Yeah. Okay. Um, we just I kind of, we... rather than go through the full scenarios, um, we hmm. just wanted to put out, as we invite anyone to click on their mic, which is down at the bottom, and it looks kind of, it's next to the video icon and next to the little person shadow with the little green dot next to it for you. Um, if anyone wants to take the mic and or use this as a live slide to jot in what's happening where you are um, and or use the chat, in that tension between care versus surveillance, which basically I propose is now a, a fourth set of tensions in open pedagogy that really needs to be addressed, um, what is happening where you are? I know that a lot of us who, who have worked in online for a long time, suddenly our institutions are like, hello, um, and we're being treated as essential workers, um, <laughs> like poor little Ralph Wiggum, when we're really trying to process a great deal that's going on. So we, we wanted to open this up as an opportunity. What is happening for you in terms of your work at your institution, your institution's decisions? Um, what kind of tensions is this creating for you, RE care and surveillance? So I've just written, because this is a really tricky area for me right now, because I'm, I, I, you know, I've just written in, we're going to ask students to check into a forum once a week so we can see who's missing. So this is a really interesting tension between care and surveillance, right? Normally, I, I would be very suspicious of that, but under these circumstances, the only way we're going to find out who hasn't got an internet connection is by is through their absence and then we can try and deal with that 
So that's, you know, you could argue that's surveillance, but you could argue it's also care. You know, these things are not completely distinct and that's why the discussion is important. So it's just an example from where I'm at at the moment. I'm seeing Gabby's story here. I remember 10 or so years ago when the OU experimented with an algorithm that sent an email to students giving them automated feedback at intervals. It was explicitly labeled as AI. Many students loved it and one commented, finally, I feel like a person and not a number to the OU. Yeah, I mean, this is going to get pretty tricky, isn't it, in terms of what's a person and what's not a person and what that means in terms of care. I, Again, from my perspective, I, I find a lot of the discussion in 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 the communities I'm in is is ultimately saying care can only be a person. Um, now, I, I kind of agree with that, but it's interesting to get that 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 sort of perspective from the OU from students to the OU. I'm just wondering, the person who had typed, there's some very interesting something in the top right corner. I can't drag your your text back into this. Wonderful, thank you. Much appreciated. Um, and inst institution and admin trying to do old-fashioned surveillance, report your hours. I'm really concerned about the switch of, um, oh. I think somebody's cleared the slide, but that's oh, fine. Sorry. Feel free to come back. I'm hearing that's OK. Um, Fresh that's comments as well. We opened ourselves to this 100% when we made the slides fully live. Um, so totally fair. We are all experimenting. No worries, Sharon. Yeah, this, this is the reality is that everyone is teaching in now. I'm not super panicked when people's contributions get erased, because they will um, when I'm doing live slides, because I've been down this road multiple times. But for someone who's new to this, they may feel like they're doing something wrong, right? When we take the rules of face-to-face -face facilitation and care and apply them to online spaces, um, then sometimes faculty um, are going and students are going to be judging themselves more harshly than um, than they need to. And so how do we even set up a space where it's safe to experiment and fail for students? Um, are we setting up spaces where students are getting three-hour Zoom lectures um, because they do the three-hour face-to-face lecture? Yes, I think happen? we are. <laughs> um, just somebody's written so many Skype meetings with management to check we are working. I think there's a really interesting thing going on at the moment as well, which I think, Bon, you were mentioning around this. The technology encourages this kind of control surveillance thing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And actually, right now we're in a time where we need more trust. I've, I've had a lot of discussions with people where it's like, how can we use the technology to ensure that X, Y and Z are doing X, Y and Z? And my response has been, this is my little bit of care. Look, we, we need to create a culture of trust. We can't, you know, we, we can't just formulate the technology to, to lock everything down. We have to accept that things like these live slides are open and a bit messy and that that requires trust. My concern is that as soon as things go digital, some people see it as an opportunity to use the technology to kind of remove trust from the relationship it's like we don't need to trust them because we've locked it all down yeah. and so i i think i i think just uh, i'd encourage people in your institutions and in your various roles to really really highlight that concept of trust and how we need it now more than ever more than ever more than ever and i noticed that teresa had mentioned you know there's a culture of presenteeism which is a term i love gone digital and so the whole environment that we're in is um, is changing very, very quickly. And one of the things that I had, you know, wanted to to bring out even a week ago was that idea of kind of this is a prime moment for those of us who have who who, who have our institutions actually paying attention to what we do, um, perhaps in a way that is rare or special, uh, different from the usual, um, have a moment to try to advocate for structures and policies because we're in a moment of significant policy shift. Uh, ben Williamson had written really well about this yesterday and I'll actually 
put that into the um, into the chat in a second. But in this moment of significant change in policy shift, part of me, my initial response was, wow, we have an opportunity to push for culture of care. At the same time, I think that we, we also need to recognize that there are fairly significant, well-funded, large forces really waiting in the wings to, to make much bigger changes. And like John mentions, what happens when you don't have the mic, right? I, I have my dean looking to me because I'm the online ed person, but my dean is not actually my president sitting at a particular table. So there are be decisions definitely being made that I'm not at the table for. I'm just gonna share something from Ben Williamson that says new pandemic and ed tech power networks, which I think is really, really great reading that I wanna recommend um, if folks have the time. Ooh, I like the look at that. Um, so there's some great things on the slide here. And I, I feel like we're actually having a workshop to a certain extent, so that, that's good. Um, yeah, brilliant. So what we'll do is move on to just the last section. Thank you for everybody uh, contributing to that. Uh, I'm glad that the, that the care versus, I mean, Bon mentioned care versus surveillance in one of our discussions and it seemed to me to be, it suddenly struck me as a very, very useful sort of way of framing a discussion. So that's why we've, we've really run with that. And I think it's a useful thing uh, it's like a tool in my mind that I'm applying to lots of situations in my institution. Um, okay, so what we wanted to do, and I think probably best to respond in chat, um, and these are huge uh, questions in some senses, but we wanted to uh, really bring scale back in at the end here. And to, I mean, some, I mean, for some of us, this is just like the day job, right? So it's not a future online course, but we wanted to bring scale back in and this is what we would have done as a speculative design uh, sort of process or activity. But really, um, we'd like you to respond to these questions. So in chat, so if you can put the number in of the question before you write your chat response, but we're looking for those kind of really pragmatic things. We want, you know, if you've got, if you think you've got a good way of responding to this, get it in chat. It could be really helpful for other people in the room because a lot of us are dealing with this right now. So to maximize. Yeah, we're the person to, to close up, right? And you don't have to answer all the questions, but if yeah, you have really. any open pedagogical practices that you want to throw out for folks, if you have any things that you've removed, um, and found that that was successful or helpful. And then how do you take care of yourself? How do you take care of your colleagues? How, yeah. how, how do we do that? Um, we just wanted to pose those as, as closing conversations. Um, what is traditional pedagogy defined as? I guess it would have to be what is traditional for you because everyone yeah. from my perspective can only speak from the actual positionality that they're in, right? So my concept may be different from yours. Um, huh. Get the teacher to get experience as an online student. Um, oh, and, well, and yeah, that's a good point. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah. Remove exam. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think I think we're seeing a lot of that happening at the moment. And uh, actually, there's a really there's a really interesting thing happening whereby some of the messages from my institutions are we're removing tests so that you can really get on with your learning and prepare yourself for your next year. At which point I said, so why do we have tests? Yeah. So, so you know, yeah, but then on the other hand, I mean, I feel like I need to make this point. On the other hand, our students like getting grades, right? They like being ranked. We are ranking institutions. That's what we do. So, you know, these are all, we're, we're in many situations with tensions that need to be negotiated. There's not a right answer in there. But it is interesting that the first thing that's being kind of switched off or pulled back from is assessment in quite a liberating way. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of question number three, I noticed that Lorna and someone else had mentioned end precarity, um, which I think is, is really important. Um, Francis makes a note that it's important to note what realizations are acceptable during crisis, um, but, oh, we want to reinstate better practice afterwards. I do think there is, for those of us who, who have a voice with somebody um, to, to point these things out, that we seem to be managing without these elements and maybe to ex 
encourage examination of them structurally. What do they serve and who do they serve? We do have, um, you know, I, I teach teachers, right? So my students have that and I always say to them right in the first class, many of us who are drawn to teaching have a little bit of Lisa Simpson in us, right? Oh, grade me, validate me. Um, <laughs> Um, but I'm, I've been teaching a pass-fail course this past year. I had to push a little bit to, to get it to be made pass-fail. And no, there isn't that sort of stick involved in getting students to work. But frankly, the work has been, been really good. Um, no, students are not necessarily prioritizing it above the already too many classes that they've got. Um, but nonetheless, the work that is coming out of it, I'm really proud of. And so there, there's a balance there that I think we have not been encouraged to consider and maybe there is an opportunity there. Teresa mentions, does the institution really care, right? The, the whole wellness thing, I get my wellness emails, I'm not a fan. Um, yeah, we all get an A. So I think, but, but also Bon, just, I mean, cause it's interesting, quite a lot of the discussion here is around the idea of assessment and grading and, and, and it's gonna be interesting to see how our students react to that because I think there'll come a point where they'll say, well, we've got, we're, we're paying you to credentialize us. And so I think as educators, we really like the idea of removing all this stuff, but to what extent are our students comfortable with that? And to what extent can we unpack the links between grading and credentials? I mean, you can still have um, credentialized pass-fail courses. Potentially. I like our new Lisa Simpson saxophones. I know that we don't have any answers, but these are all answers and paths. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, we've moved now from the Lisa Simpson badge to the Ralph badge, which I think I could wear with pride. So I feel much more like a Ralph <laughs> um, these days. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wanted just to open these, these questions with this smart crowd of, of folks, we're all kind of deep in it right now. We're, we're in one of those futures that I had initially thought back in January when we got our acceptance, I heard about coronavirus and I thought, oh, well, maybe that could be one of our, you know, futures. What if this goes this route? Well, here we are. Um, so um, and, I'm just um, yeah. responding to Gabby. I think there's another really interesting tension there, which is the the lots of staff concept and yes that makes sense but then if you have lots of staff you have to charge students a lot of money and then certain st students become excluded so again it's a tension to be negotiated um, but you know it would be I think a lot of people in the UK remember back to when they were students and it was a completely different scale of system and it was publicly funded. I mean, we're, we're now not publicly funded on, the, you know, which has many negative aspects to it. But also there's an awful lot more students involved, like about five times more students involved than when I went to university. So there's there, there's there's part there's a participation element to it as well. There um, is. And Graham brings out the formative assessment as an open pedagogical practice, which is one of the ones that my own teaching practice is built on. But when I have even a couple of hundred students a term, I do find it very difficult to do that kind of individual network formative piece. I do a lot of peer stuff with them, but yeah, all, all of these are real tensions. I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. Um, yeah. It is 6.56 a.m. Soon the sun will be coming up in Windsor, Ontario. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us to think out loud about this. Uh, we're going to, I want to take a good, strong look through the, um, through the chat and, uh, and think about all the things that you've brought forward. And I want to thank you. Um, and please wash your hands and take, like, see good care. Yeah. I am actually watching all of this happen with, with great fear. Um, and so I, I wish you all well, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Can I just encourage everybody to bring some of these themes up at their own institutions and in their own context, because it does make a difference. I sit somewhere at the bottom of the top of my institution, and it's really, really, really useful when people say, actually, we need this to be trust, not technology. Actually, we need to consider how we can care for our students, not just deliver content. So, you know, I really encourage people to <clears throat> be a strong voice out there right now.
it's very very helpful um and uh it's, it, it's useful for people who are in like management situations to hear that and sometimes it's useful because they can pick that up and they can throw it further up the chain in a very hierarchical way okay. thank you very much for engaging everybody